So I wanted to talk about the XM5 rifle. You've already talked about it at great length, though. I mean, at mediocre length. So, yeah, I want I wanted to talk about it again because I've been... <laughs> you love it so much. I've been following up about it and doing some research. And I, I am willing to admit when I am wrong... Sometimes, um, yes. Sometimes. Other times, no. I will die on that hill. <laughs> because it's a nice hill and I like it. Yes. I, you know, honestly, it's just it's just humanity. It's a problem with humanity in general. Where you, you have this thing. Let's say I am me in the, 19, in the 1950s. And the army is going to be replacing the M14 with this newfangled plastic an aluminum thing called the XM16. I'm going to throw a fit about it because it's not in the rifle caliber. It's made of plastic and aluminum, and I'm gonna, it's probably made by Mattel. Which, for the record, that, that, this is I'm, I'm changing topics here because I have attention deficit disorder. Uh-huh. I'm changing topics here. But there is ne- there never was actually an M16 made by Mattel. Okay. If any boomer tells you that they had an M16 that was stamped by Mattel, they're full of shit. Doesn't they have to be a boomer. It could be somebody from any time any, cohort. It, it, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It, if anybody tells you that they have an M16 that was stamped by Mattel, they're lying. Mattel never made M16s. It'd be nice if they did though. That was just a, that was a rumor. That was a rumor that people propagated because it was made of plastic and it was made, it was so easy to take apart that a child could do it. That is Full of shit. 100% lie. It was made by Milton Bradley. I think Milton Bradley is... <laughs> who's Milton Bradley a division of? They might be Mattel. Or maybe it's Hasbro? Yeah, maybe Hasbro. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not like a... I'm not a toy nerd. Like I am a gun nerd. Though a lot of times I wish I was a toy nerd. Because <laughs> you can't really... You can. But it's hard to kill someone with a toy. Yeah. Why, do, why do guns have to be my special interest? Why couldn't it have been garbage trucks? If you bludgeon somebody with a toy hard enough, then... Why did why did the thing that I love that I really like and I really care about have to be a political issue? I don't know. Why couldn't it have? Ju- why couldn't I have been interested in garbage trucks? I don't know. Anyway, I'm getting way off topic. <laughs> you are. You are very much. I'm so far off topic. People in general have a tendency to prefer the thing that they're used to. So myself, because I was trained with the M16 and M4, and I would. I would consider myself an expert on the M16 and M4 series of mm-hmm. rifles or AR15s in general. So when the military is like, "Hey, we're replacing these," my instant reaction is, "No, you're wrong. Dude, it's a perfect weapon. There's nothing wrong with it." Oh my god, you're so dumb. The same reaction you had to the sights you mentioned? Yes, I, I'll get to that in a second. Thank you for bringing that up because I almost forgot about that. You mentioned last time how they were adding optics to their firearms and you didn't think it was a good idea and they're all going to brick. And- oh, yeah, with the red dot sights, yeah. That is that is a very distinct problem. I've been doing a lot of, of like looking into this. I've watched quite a few different videos on it. The, basically, anyone that has a video on the XM5 or the SIG MCX Spear, as it's now called, or as the civilian version is called, I've watched all the videos on that. I've done a bunch of reading or like reading up on it. I've talked to quite a few people that are like in the firearms industry about like the SIG MCX Spear. Haven't gotten your hands on one yourself I, No, I haven't gotten my hands on one because they cost $8,000 on the civilian market. <laughs> like that would stop you. Uh, no, that would. Generally, anything over $2,000 is like I have to really, really think about whether I want to spend that kind of money. Hmm. Anything over $2,000 for a weapon, I basically have to be like, yeah, but why? <laughs> Why would I why would I spend that much money on this thing? Mm. Anyway, from everything I've seen, the SIG MCX has actually been a very a very good a very good rifle. It seems to work very well. One of the concerns that I had about it about it being heavy is still very true. Mm. The fact that it's heavy is still very true. Um it is a it is a hefty rifle. I think it's going to be like 14 pounds when it's fully loaded out. That's not an issue to be ignored. No, that definitely is not an issue to be ignored especially with how much weight we keep adding to soldiers. Because, like, in World War II, the average soldier was carrying maybe, like, 20 pounds of gear. And now it's, like... Everyone's got flak vests and heavy rifles. Yeah. It's a lot of weight. So that it, the weight is definitely a concern. And when I had said earlier in the last video, one of the things I had said is, I think it would make a very good DMR, but I don't think it's going to be good for standard infantry service. The Army is serious about adopting this as their standard rifle. They really want this, do they? They really want this. Um, 
I I am still concerned about volume of fire, but not for the reason a lot of people would expect. When, when I say I'm concerned about volume of fire, people are like, oh, he's concerned about the fact that it's going to be uncontrollable on full auto. Apparently, this rifle is actually very controllable. Okay. On like on full auto, it's very controllable. The recoil is not bad. It's a very a very mild shooting rifle, which is good. My concern is magazine capacity because it's kind of hard to get more than like twenty five rounds out of a full ca- out of a full rifle caliber magazine. But I will say I spent a lot of time in the military just using twenty round mags because it was more convenient. How is it more convenient to have a smaller magazine? Uh, because it doesn't stick out as far out of the bottom of the gun. If you're trying to, if you're laying prone on the ground and you're trying to get as low as possible, having a twenty round magazine means you can get even lower to the ground, or you can hold your firearm sideways, just tilt your head to the side. Yeah, that is another thing. But um, I, the twenty round magazine doesn't really concern me that much. Um, and speaking uh, on the topic of like full auto, about whether or not it's controllable on full auto, this is this is entirely my personal experience. I don't know about like frontline infantry because I was not frontline infantry, so I can't speak to how they would normally operate. Mm. But in a open warfare type scenario, anytime I did anytime I did training for like an open warfare type scenario, I primarily used semi-auto anyway. I didn't generally use full auto or three round burst that often. Right. If I'm trying to do suppressing fire, maybe. But generally, my my thought process is as as a rifleman, I'm trying to somewhat conserve ammo, so I'm trying to do more careful aimed shots. I'm not just flipping the thing onto auto and going and then dumping it, slapping a new magazine there, going and then slapping a new magazine in, just it's, doing that over and over again. I'm doing sustained fire on semi auto so that it's more I, I i'm increasing my hit probability sure yes so i don't think the fact that the i don't think the fact that the, the rifle really is only going to have 20 round magazines or that it has because it is actually controllable on full auto apparently apparently okay um based on what i've the research i've done um it is actually controllable on full auto and the 20 round magazines i don't think are a huge detriment the problem is is because it's a large caliber rifle that means you have to you carry less ammo now why do you carry less? Because the the rounds are bigger. So for basically, you could carry 120 rounds of 556, five, or maybe a hundred rounds of 762. Mm. So what you're saying about these new rifles is that the bullet is bigger, the weapon itself is heavier. Mm-hmm. Is there any substantial increase in accuracy or punching through armor for these new firearms and bullets? Yes. There is actually an increase in armor penetration, armor penetration at distance, and accuracy. You are getting improvements on all of those ones. Um, but is it substantial enough to warrant a new firearm? I think so, yes. Really? Yes. I think that when the technology improves to a point, yes, it is definitely, it is definitely time to consider that upgrade. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I agree with that sentiment. I just don't know if we're at that point yet, are we? I think we are. I'm not keeping up on the firearms. If, if we can punch through twice as thick armor with these new bullets, I guess. I, th- I think we are. The The main reason the army is going to this new one is because they're more concerned now about a peer-to-peer warfare than they were in, like, 20 years ago. In the early 2000s, most of what the army is... Entirely what the army was firing was asymmetric, uh, asymmetric warfare of... Full-scale military versus an insurgent force. Mm. So at the time, I would argue that a an intermediate cartridge would make more sense then. Mm-hmm. Because they're more concerned about a peer-to-peer conflict. And because body armor has become so common in those militaries, or just any military, like the U.S. military, for example, now issues like full body armor mm-hmm. for everybody. Yeah, Because they're concerned about that, they're going with a larger caliber projectile that is actually capable of punching through armor. An example of basically technology improving to a point where now it makes sense to do it is in the early 2000s, putting an optic on a handgun was just like baffling. The only people, the only people that were doing that were competition shooters. And they were putting these giant Seymour red dot optics that were relative, that were honestly pretty fragile Hmm. for an optic. I'm not talking about like you sneeze on it, it's going to break. But it's it's not something that you would put on a weapon and then try to go into combat with it. Okay. It's going to break in five minutes. Mm-hmm. You're going to get out of the Humvee, you're going to bonk it on the door, and it's going to it's going to shatter. Mm-hmm. So in the early 2000s, putting an optic on a handgun didn't really make much sense. Now we're we're at a point where 
basically every single handgun manufacturer, every single major handgun manufacturer offers an optics ready version of their handgun from the factory. Hmm. That's just set up to accept the red dot sight. I would be willing to say that within the next like 10 years, it will be odd if you get a gun that doesn't have the ability to mount a red dot. I would say if you don't have the ability already, it's kind of weird. I feel like even if you don't want a red dot, most guns should be standardized to have the ability to put one on. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a, there's always going to be exceptions to that rule, like collectible handgun. Like if you want a handgun that looks like a... <laughs> Unless you're getting like a, a classic model... Yeah, I mean, if you want a gun that looks like a military issue 1911 from from 1940, then yeah, you're not going to put a red dot on it. No, if you get, if you I'm, get, I mean, like, I'm talking about excluding collectors' editions. Yeah, but I, I think like most handguns that are going to be designed for uh, like sports shooting or personal defense or duty carry, uh, duty, um, <laughs> anything like that is going to be set up to accept the red dot now because red dots are such an improvement over iron sights. They are pretty cool. Um, so. That is that is an example of we've improved to a point that now it's time to accept this like new thing. One of the things that I didn't bring up the last time we were talking about this was the absolutely fuck off massive chamber pressure of the six point eight cartridge that the 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 army has adopted. If there's a lot of chamber pressure, then there would probably be a lot of kickback unless the rifle was designed around it. Basically, yeah, it's designed around that, but also it's the the chamber pressure doesn't really uh, affect recoil as much as you think. It's more it's more Newton's laws of equal and opposite reaction. So when you have a bigger ball, it's going to impart more recoil on okay. the gun. Th- that's why a twelve gauge slug has more felt recoil than a five five six projectile. The five five six projectile is actually going faster than a twelve gauge is, but because a twelve gauge is a one ounce slug that you're accelerating to faster than the speed of sound, you have the exact same amount of force being imparted on your shoulder in the opposite direction. So this new rifle is well designed around this new bullet. Yes, yes, it is. And the new bullet was like specifically designed to go in this to go in this new rifle. Anyway, the huge chamber pressure it has, which is in I if I'm recalling this correctly, is in excess of eighty thousand PSI inside the chamber. I, I wish I could give you an example of other ones. I can't remember exactly what other ones are. It suffice to say that most other firearms have a much lower chamber pressure. <laughs> this is like stupid hot. Having said that, the only time you're getting that huge, that massive chamber pressure is when you're using the combat ammunition for it. So with grenade launchers, multiple types of ammo, but the two main types of ammo you're going to be using are practice ammo, which is like the chalk rounds, and then high explosive ammo or high explosive dual purpose or whatever. Are you saying that this new rifle has military cartridges and civilian cartridges? Yes. It has military cartridges, and then it also has training ammo. The training ammo is just a normal... It's the normal, like, brass shell casing with a standard lead core projectile in it. This is the ammo that you will be firing most of the time while you're in the military... When you're doing training, or if you're a civilian and you own one of these ru- one of these guns, this is the ammo you'll probably be firing hmm. because it's not nearly as expensive as the other ammo. It's weird that they're calling it training ammo. It's still lethal. Oh yeah, well, yeah, but it's your it's ammo that you use when you're doing when you're doing training. Still, I wouldn't associate. When you hear you hear the word training ammo, you think oh like a blank. No, I still think it's probably lethal. Well, maybe- I think bl- when I think blank ammo, I think blank ammo i i I feel like there's going to be more than one instance of someone going don't worry it's just training ammo blam (sighs) it's going to happen if you're gonna if you're going to call this training ammo there's going to be a problem i don't i don't think there will be i don't know if they're going to specifically call it training ammo but they'll oh actually you know what they'll probably call it they'll probably call it ball ammo or practice ammo or something. <laughs> Still, practice ammo no, has the same problem. I, I don't think so, because the, the, you have specifically dummy ammo or blanks. I, I feel like you're overestimating the average person's ability to differentiate between these different types. You call something a training ammo, or a blank round, or a dummy round, or a practice round, and in, in my head and in many civilian heads, it's all the same. I would hope that the military would be different, but probably not. I'm just going to continue calling it practice ammo for now. Fine, the, yes. The practice ammo is a standard brass shell casing with powder and projectile in it. That ammo is not going to be nearly as hard on the barrel. They have another type of ammo, which I... Um, a new it, type of ammo! More than lethal! It is their dual cartridge... It's their like dual material cartridge. In order to be able to handle the absolutely massive chamber pressure of the 
military combat ammo that they developed. They had to make a shell casing that's made of two pieces. The back of it is actually made of stainless steel, and the rest of the body is made out of brass. <laughs> I bet you these bullets are way more expensive. Oh God, yeah. I, I honestly, I I think I think there's something like three or four dollars a bullet per bullet. It's very expensive, but it also will punch through body armor. Emptying a magazine is a down payment on a vehicle. Yeah, that's why. That's why. Whenever we did training, we just sat behind the machine guns and went bang, 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 bang <laughs> because we had budget cuts. Anyway, really? <laughs> is, were, is it an actual story? I mean, for the first like two weeks in basic training, when they gave you guns, they didn't give you ammunition because they weren't sure that you were gonna that, you were gonna try to shoot somebody. So you just had to go bang, 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 bang. That's not the same thing. Yes, you don't give brand new fresh recruits actual ammo, but when you have actual soldiers and marines, and you're going out of firing exercise, you don't normally go. Well, budget cuts. We have no ammo. In my experience, it's usually along the lines of, we got budgeted all this ammo. I don't want to see any of it coming back. Yeah. So, it, from what I understand, there's basically like three cartridges that they designed for this gun. There's the the ball ammo, the one that's like an upgraded one that uses the dual case design, um, but that still isn't as hot as like the military ammo. And as far as I know, I don't think it has like the, the armored or the tungsten penetrator in the bullet that's designed to just rip through armor. And then there's the military cartridge. Yes, the military, the, the one that has the 80,000 PSI chamber pressure, that one is going to rip through barrels. But in, in watching, when military analysts looked at what happened in like the Donbass region of Ukraine in 2014 and just modern peer-to-peer -peer combat scenarios, they've basically found that most weapons don't need to survive long enough to worry about that chamber pressure. Hmm. When you're firing a round that has that 80,000 PSI chamber pressure, yes, maybe after 20,000 rounds, your barrel is completely cooked. But in these modern combat scenarios, you don't really ever get to that many rounds. Either the soldier gets incapacitated, or the weapon gets damaged, or they have to go to the rear and you can just replace the parts then. Stuff happens that means that you don't necessarily have to worry about actually reaching that. If you have a car, that this car is only designed to get you from Florida to Oklahoma. You're driving from Florida to Oklahoma and then the car is going to be scrapped once it gets there. All right. You kind of don't really care what happens to the car in between it. As long as it gets you to the end goal, it doesn't matter. I see. That's why rental insurance that's, is so expensive. That's why rental insurance is so expensive and they get trashed all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's I, I feel like they kind of went with that philosophy of we don't really care about the chamber pressure because this thing isn't going to last for 20,000 rounds anyway. Also, the barrels on the, on the new one are very, very easy to change. You basically pop the handgun off, undo two screws, barrel comes out through the front, put a new barrel in, tighten two screws down, put the handguard back on. Oh, okay. So I, I feel like the chamber pressure doesn't really matter if you're changing out stuff that quickly. All right. Or if, if you're changing out that stuff that quickly, or if you're, the weapon doesn't have to last that long. So yeah, I feel like maybe I was a little too harsh on it. I do still have some concerns. Will this be the right move for the military as a new weapon to adopt? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I'm not sure. But they are very serious about this is the new infantry rifle. The optic, that's what I was going to talk about. So <laughs> it's got a new computer controlled optic. I did not know initially that this new optic that it has is what is called an LPV, a uh, low power variable optic. It's basically a normal hunting rifle optic, mm -hmm. only you can go from one power, which is no magnification, up to whatever. I, I don't know what the new one the new one for the army is. I believe it's like eight power. So it zooms out and in. I've used LPVOs. They work very well. They're really good optics. The nice thing about them is it's magnified optic. Mm -hmm. that you can run it on one power so you can use it like a red dot sight. Right. And then you can increase the magnification up when you need to make longer or more precise shots. Wasn't your initial concern with that its frailty? Yes. Like the computer controlled part, I am worried about that. But because this is based on an LPVO, because it's based on a variable power magnified optic, if the computer part fails, you can still use the optic. As a one times sight. No, you can use it as you can use it as a one to eight power sight. It just won't be giving you the ballistic calculations that the computer would normally do. Oh, okay. So now you have to use it as you have to use it like anybody would use an optic now, where I need to know at this distance how far up do I need to aim. If I'm doing if there's this much wind, how far left to right do I need to aim? 
You have to, you, now you have to do all those calculations in your head. Hmm. You don't have a little computer going, oh, the target's at this distance, point here. Yeah. You don't have a computer adjusting the optic for you. Yeah, you no longer have a computer eliminating the need for Kentucky windage. Yes, exactly. So I, I did not know that. I had, when I was originally reading about this, my knowledge of it was, it's a computer-controlled optic. <laughs> I had like I looked into it a little bit. I did not realize that it was bi- that the whole system could be used without the optic. I thought the army was going fucking all in on having a 100% integrated computer controlled optic. You were witness to so many awful decisions by the army. You just assume any decision they make is going to be a bad one. Kind of, yeah. When I heard about this optic, I was thinking about the OICW, which was just an absolute fucking nightmare of a gun. Hmm. I was thinking about uh, one of the machine guns they had designed, I forget what it was, but it was basically like a 20 millimeter machine gun that had an integrated computer optic in it. That if the computer optic went down, you can't use your machine gun anymore. <laughs> because it's not, it, the, the, the computer optic is no longer ranging for you and telling the rounds when they need to detonate. So that's, what, that's where I came from thinking about this optic. I did not know that it basically was if you had a little computer controlling your magnified optic. So... I'm 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 going back on what I said about the optic. I think that if it's if this is the scenario, it's probably a good idea. Okay. We'll see how well it holds up to abuse, but I I think that this is this is an interesting idea and I kind of want to see where it goes. Let's see if this dog has legs. Sure. I still have to say though that the weight is going to be a a big problem because no matter how good a rifle is, mm-hmm. no matter how technically proficient it is, no matter how good it is at punching through armor, the average person isn't going to see much use with it. Maybe, at most, 1% of their military career. But they're going to have to carry it around 99% of the time. And it's going to be a pain in the butt. The, the weight is a lot. And it's going to be a pain in the ass. People aren't, they aren't going to want to have to deal with it. 14 pounds is a lot for a rifle. I get annoyed when my guns weigh 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. And the other problem with its weight is that it's front heavy. Oh, it's gee, not like so. It's my, even worse. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the um, the VHS two that I have or Springfield Hellion with an optic on it. That thing weighs about nine pounds, but it's very well balanced because it's a bullpup. Mm-hmm. Because it's not front heavy, you don't notice the weight as much. When you have fourteen pounds and it's all hanging right over where your support hand is on the gun, that gets real annoying. You would say that before they properly adopt this, they need to rebalance it. Perhaps I I'm not sure. Uh, they add a counterweight to the back end. Now it's twenty pounds. Yeah, I'm. I'm really not sure. Is it a sling thing? Can they, can they fix it with a sling? I mean, yeah, you can put it on a sling, but that's still a lot of weight. The the thing I was pushing back on you with it is that most of the soldiers that are going to be getting this now are frontline infantry. So they're the ones that are going to be getting it and then actually using it a lot of the time. It won't be a thing of where they're carrying it around and then only using it like one percent of the time. Okay. Will this be a good thing? I do, I feel like it's a good rifle. I feel like it'll work well. I don't think it's like the M14, which was a massive mistake. Will it be a good fit? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, I guess we'll leave that to the powers that be, the people that make those decisions. They will make the decisions, and uh, we will be here judging them. We'll, we'll be here silently judging them. No, we're not and, silent about it at all. Oh, no, yeah. We'll be here judging them and being like, You made the wrong decision! Oh, my God! <laughs> um... Yeah, a bunch of people gave me a flack in the previous one for bringing up the the Bradley War or the the Pentagon Wars. I uh, I apologize for that. <laughs> I am not a tank nerd. Sorry you guys didn't enjoy that movie. Jeez. Yeah. I I am I so yeah, the guy that that is based on is a, a divisive character, we'll say. The person who made the movie or the No, person? the person that wrote the book that the movie is based on. I forget what his name is. It doesn't matter. Um, Take that, author. He was he was basically part of procurement. He had an axe to grind with procurement and the U.S. military and the army as a whole because they didn't adopt the thing that he liked. Hmm. He had an axe to grind. So basically, he, he took it out on the Bradley. He took okay. it out on the Bradley infantry fighting vehicle and was like, Oh, that thing's a piece of shit because you didn't like what I, what I liked. The Bradley had some legitimate problems. It did have, yes, it did have some legitimate problems. However, those were all addressed before it actually went into service. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I said some things that were incorrect about that. I was misled on that. I am not a tank expert by 
any stretch of the imagination. And for that matter, neither are most of you. Um, and if you want to go one step further, you're not even a gun expert. You're just a passionate aficionado. Yep, I would I would argue that I am an expert on the I'm an expert on the weapons that I knew how to that I knew how to repair while I was in the military. Mm-hmm. But this gun, this XM5, that you I'm know, I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, I would not consider myself an expert on most firearms. In fact, I I would argue that the only guns I'm an expert on are the M16 and M4 series of weapons. Yeah, me too. You're not an expert on those. I, I know they use different five, five, six caliber cartridges. You're not an expert on those. Ask me anything about them. I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, what is what is the optimal rifling twist for a fifty-five grain projectile? Four. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Am I correct or am I correct? No, you are not correct. <laughs> so, yeah, I was I was incorrect on many things about the Bradley. I'm sorry. It, again, it comes back to that whole thing of, this is my favorite thing. How dare you say bad thing about my favorite thing? Why didn't you adopt my favorite thing? Because if that was still the case, then we'd still be using fucking boats with sails on them <laughs> and black powder cannons. Mm -hmm. Because why would you ever say that? We, we would still be, we would still be bonking each other with sticks because why would you ever improve pointy stick, pointy stick bad, round stick better. This firearm won the first world war. So how could it ever be bad? Yeah. One of the things that is just absolutely stupid to me is they designed the Bradley with, they're basically modified versions of M4 or M16s that stick out the sides of it. Okay. Originally, they were just supposed to be ports hmm. that you just shove your gun in the port and then shoot out the port. And they actually had things like this in World War II, where it was, you would stick a grease gun out one of these little firing ports so that if there were infantry near your Bradley or near your your vehicle, you could shoot at them without having to get out of the vehicle and expose yourself to shoot at the enemy near your vehicle. So they decided they wanted these on the Bradley, so they, they put little firing ports on there. But then they were like, oh, but then technically, like, the firing ports are kind of dumb, so why don't, we, why don't we replace the firing ports with a port firing weapon? So it's a weapon that goes into that that you can shoot out with. Okay. But then you just leave the gun in the port. Mm, strange. Okay, fine, we'll do that. So they did that, and then they found out that a bunch of the soldiers were d taking the, the soldiers that operated the Bradley, like the driver and the gunner and the tank commander, if they had to get out of the Bradley, they were taking the port firing weapon with them <laughs> mm -hmm. because it was smaller and easier to carry around than a fucking M16A2. <laughs> they were like, yeah, we'll just take this thing instead because it's smaller and lighter and easier to carry around. Well, and somebody in the budget, in the budget office didn't fucking like that. All so right. they so what they did is they ended up converting the port firing weapons to a modified version where they removed the iron sights from it. So now you can't aim it anymore. They cranked the firing rate up to a point where it's uncontrollable if you are if you're trying to hand shoot it. Mm -hmm. And they removed the wire stock from it. So now you have no stock, you have no sights and you can't control it when you try to fire it. Because they didn't like the fact that soldiers were taking it out of the vehicle and running around with it. Again, soldiers Choosing to go for the lighter of the two weapons. Yup. The more easy to handle weapon. Yeah. Because if you're in a vehicle, if you're driving a Bradley, if it's 1980 or 1985, you're driving a Bradley around, you have to get out of the Bradley and possibly engage some infantry. And you have to climb out through this thing that's about the size of a manhole cover. Mm -hmm. Are you going to try to climb out of that th this thing the size of a manhole cover with one... An M16 with a 20-inch barrel that the overall length is like 40-something inches. Mm -hmm. Or two, a different version of the M16 that is like 26 inches. I'm going to take the shorter one. Right. Yes. But yeah, somebody was real mad about that. So they modified these port-firing weapons to be a thing that is basically uncontrollable unless it's in a port. Probably because the name of it was the port firing weapon. So they went, why are they taking it out of the vehicle? It's for firing out of a port. You're not supposed to carry it with you. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I got off on a whole tangent there. That's just how it goes. Yep. That's what I do. I got brain problems. I like to talk about military stuff. In summation, you love the Bradley. I don't love the Bradley. And I didn't, I didn't hate the Bradley while I was in the military either. I have no ill will against it. It's a fine <laughs> infantry fighting vehicle. There still were budget overruns on it. There still were problems with it in development. But everything has problems in development. Mm -hmm. Every every weapon or thing that the military uses has problems during development. 
So I was incorrect on that. I'm sorry that I was incorrect on it. But sometimes, y'all tank nerds are absolutely fucking intolerable. <laughs> so you don't love the Bradley. I don't, I don't say that. It's <laughs> fine. I don't have a problem with the Bradley. Okay. You're indifferent to the Bradley. I guess, yeah. It's fine. It is kind of big, though. Like, the BMP, it's kind of tall. I can't keep it in my garage. It's kind of tall. The BMP, like, the, the Russian BMP is a lot shorter. But also, the Russian BMP was designed in, like, 1960-something, so... It's only short because it's malnourished. So, in summation, this is not your favorite tank. No, well, actually, no, it isn't my favorite tank. Aha! It is not my favorite tank. Do you know what my favorite tank is? Yes. What is it? Shelly. Who is Shelly? You you don't have a tank named Shelly? No. Okay, I guess I don't know what your favorite tank is. Oh, okay. My favorite tank is a Stridzvagen 103. I that was that was my second guess. Was it? Was it really? <laughs> yeah. What's yes. my favorite part about the Stridzvagen 103? You, you like the Stortz wagon's treads and also its barrel. <laughs> just saying things. <laughs> just just having fun with your mouth words. It's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> 